Okay, I think I, I've noticed that there are, uh, among those of us who are healthy, uh, and it's the, wor the worst thing that we have to face is, is, is isolation. And there's really, I think, two different kinds of isolation problems. One is people who are just by themselves and are feeling alone and disconnected from the world. And then there are those of us, like those of us in our house, who are in a house with like five people and the dog. And every day is a little bit like a Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> so it's, it's Dee Dee and me, it's my daughter and uh, my daughter's fiance and Dee Dee's brother, my brother-in-law, Todd. And we're, you know, we're, we're getting along fine, but it's, it is, it, it, the, the house has never felt so small. I'll tell you that. Um, give us a little sense of, of, of Belgrade Lakes itself, because normally this time of year, there wouldn't be very many people um, there in, in um, um, your, your subdivision. Um, are a lot of are a lot of people coming to their summer homes earlier this year than um, I I thought that I saw a, a few more cars up here. So we live in a what's called a, a lake association, which is basically a dirt road with um, a score or more of houses scattered around. And um, usually, folks start to come up. Well, you know. Um, sometimes as late as the 4th of July, but we, we start to see people um, when school lets out. And I've, I've, seen, I've seen more people, but um, uh, I think the real difference I see is in Belgrade Lakes Village itself, which is, you know, our, our town is between the two lakes, the two Belgrade Lakes um, of Long Pond and Great Pond. And there's a general store, there's a, 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 a diner and bar, and then there's a kind of elegant um, restaurant and, and tavern called, called the Village Inn. And of course, um, the, they were all closed for a while and now at least the Village Inn and, and the general store are doing kind of curbside delivery. Yeah. Um, and they're, they're really doing just the kind of um, a, a courageous work in, you know, you, you, you call them up, you tell them what you want. If you call the Village Inn, they'll, you know, they'll make your duck. Mm -hmm. The village inn is known for ducks, so they'll make your duck, they'll bring it out to your car. Um, and so uh, people are, 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 are hanging in there. They're, it's a, it's a, like a lot of towns in Maine, it's a scrappy town. But, you know, there's, there is the question of, I mean, like a lot of little towns in Maine, are a, a, a lot of the merchants in our town live, basically their whole business is based around July, August, and, and the first half of September. And I think we're all kind of wondering, well, what is the world going to be like then? Yeah. I asked because I was talking with a, with a reporter from the Boston Globe um, yesterday or the day before. The days are all running in together now. Right. Just, yeah. um, and she was saying that she has, um, she, she works, obviously she works for the Boston Globe and they have an apartment in, in, in Boston. Um, and, um, and they have Massachusetts plates, but she's in Maine a lot because she, and she has a, they have a, a house, their actual residence is, is on Munjoy Hill, just a few blocks from where I'm talking to you from. Right. Um, and, you know, so they came up a couple of weekends ago, I think, just to visit the house for a little bit, get away for the weekend. And they were left notes on their car, which have Massachusetts plates, um, uh. saying, saying, go home. Um, which was which was a, um, a little I mean, for somebody who this is, they they consider this you know she's spent most of her life um, here in Maine and here in Portland and to be told to go home when she thinks of herself as home when she's when she's here yeah. is disconcerting. Yeah, I, I published a, a piece. Oh, I guess it's almost uh, six weeks ago, five weeks ago now. On the on, I've been doing a thing for my New York Times column. The last three have the subtitle has been a journal of the plague year, mm -hmm. and the first one was about leaving New York City and really, and it was all very new. I think it was the might have been the twelfth or the fourteenth of March, and I wasn't just wasn't sure when I was coming back, and it was it was it was full of that kind of early, oh my God, can you believe this is happening? And I described as leaving, leaving New York City, where I, I teach at Barnard College in the spring semester. That's why I was down there. Um, and going back to Maine, well, the comments on the Times page were, there were some really quite um, judgmental ones about how dare you um, head off, head off to your vacation home, 
you know, and I, I wanted to say it, it's not my vacation. That's where I've spent more than half my life here. But um, I think people are looking for someone to blame. And I think, um, and there you are. Well, yeah, thanks. <laughs> because because we're up against a disease, um, uh, a virus, um, certain politicians notwithstanding, there's kind of no one to say, well, this this is what we're this is what we're up against. Yeah. So um, you know, we we so we turn on each other. Well, let's, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I, I probably shouldn't even have brought that up. It's, it's worth talking about, but it, it's delaying us from talking about your wonderful, wonderful, wonderful book. I just, I just love this book, Jenny. I've told you that, but I want to, I want to say it in front of um, um, uh, the other people who are part of this chat tonight. Um, I think it is some of your very, very best work. Um, uh, and I don't want to say, let's just start us off with a, start us off with a reading. It's, it's not my judgment here. You're going to, you're going you're gonna, to, you're going to show us a little bit about what you're doing. All right. Um, I, I thought I'd read two short things. Um, uh, I, somebody wrote me uh, a note and said, Jenny, I really want to read your new book, but I'm afraid it's, it, 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 it's called Good Boy. Um, my Life and Seven Dogs. Does that mean, am I going to end up crying? And you know, in a way, I wanted to say, oh, no, 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 no. But I mean, of course, I mean, to, to, to write about dogs, to talk about dogs, in some ways, it's the, the twin things that we struggle with. The fact that we, we, we love dog, to, to love it, to, to have a dog means to learn a lot about love, but it also means to learn something about loss as well. And because they don't live forever, um, unlike you and me. Yes. Well. So... Um, I'll read you these two pieces, these two moments um, uh, in the book that I think will um, capture both of those moments. And I'll start, this is, this begins, this is just from the very first um, chapter in the book, which is called Do, Too Dark to Read. And that, that title comes from a, a, a Groucho Marx joke that at this point I have to figure everyone in the world knows, but in case anyone has never heard the joke, um, Groucho said something like, um, uh, outside of a dog, um, a book is man's best friend. Inside of a dog, it's too dark to read. Ha ha ha. Thank you, Gracho. So here's too dark to read. I took her picture one sparkling autumn day as she stood in our dirt road waiting. There was a bright red maple leaf on the ground. A year later, I held that photo in my hands as the tears rolled down, and Eva Cassidy ballad Autumn Leaves played on the radio. It was an old, sad song. My children had been 10 and 12 back in 2006. Our family had been through a wrenching couple of years, and yet we'd emerged on the other side of those days, still together, the four of us plus Ranger, the Black Lab. Our lives revolved around that dog and each other. But we worried that Ranger felt puny when we weren't around. Sometimes we arrived back at the house to hear him howling piteously. It was heartbreaking, his loneliness. Then someone emailed us about this dog named Indigo. She'd had puppies a few months before and now she needed a home. Were the Boylans interested? The Boylans were. Indigo joined us as Ranger's wing dog. When she first stepped through the door, her underbelly still showed the recent signs of the litter she'd delivered. Between the wise, droopy face and the swinging dog teeth, she was a sight to behold. She had a nose for trouble. On one occasion, I came home to find that she'd eaten a five-pound bag of flour. She was covered in white powder, and flour paw prints were everywhere, including, incredibly, the countertops. I asked the dog what the hell had happened, and Indy just looked at me with a glance that said, I, can't ima I cannot imagine to what you are referring. Time passed. Our children grew up and went off to college. I left my job at Colby College in Maine and joined the faculty at Barnard. My mother died at age 94. The mirror, which had reflected a young mom when Indigo first barged through the door, now showed a woman in late middle age. I had surgery for cataracts. I began to lose my hearing. We all turned gray, me, my spouse, the dogs. That summer I took Indigo for one last walk. 
She was slow and unsteady on her paws. She looked up at me mournfully. She said, you did say you'd take care of me when the time came. You promised. Indy died on an August afternoon, a tennis ball at her side. Sometimes in the weeks that followed, I find myself searching for her as if she might be sleeping in one of my children's empty bedrooms, but she wasn't there. What was it I was looking for as I poked around the house? Was it really the dog I'd lost? By the time you're in your 50s, a lot of things have flown. You learn to make your peace with ghosts, but it's an uneasy truce at best. I'd sit in my children's bedrooms now and again and get all mopey about the fact that they'd become adults so swiftly. Here were the talismans of their childhood, finger paintings from pre-K, an old soccer ball, college diplomas. The rooms reminded me of a photograph I'd once seen of the tomb of Tutankhamun with the relics of the boy king's life, a golden mask, an ancient checkerboard strewn around the burial chamber. They lay where they'd been left 3,000 years before. Okay, so that's the, the loss part. Here's a slightly different story. Um, and this is from the third chapter, which is about a dog named Matt the Mutt, 1979. <clears throat> this is known in the business as a cold open. Holy shit, it's Matt the Mutt. He's here, he's there. He's got Penny in a corner. He's got his front paws on that dog's back. What's he doing? Tee haw, Matt the Mutt. Now he's satisfied and he's off, trotting down the hall, running down the staircase. Wait, what's this? He's paused on the second floor landing. He's lifting his leg and woohoo, he's whizzing right there on the wall. Matt the Mutt cannot be stopped. Was that the back door? Look out below. He's running down the stairs two steps at a time, arriving in the mudroom precisely in time to attack my father, who's lumbering through the door. Dad had hoped to sneak into the house without Matt the Mutt hearing about it, but Matt the Mutt cannot be stopped. He's leaping into the air and barking and pushing back upon my father's shoulders with both paws before falling back onto the floor and then leaping once more while barking and trying a second time to tackle my father and bring him down. My mother's footsteps are coming swiftly, but not swiftly enough. Matt the Mutt leaps into the air again, barking and snarling. Dad is trying to ward him off with his briefcase. Dad is not succeeding. No, my mother says, reaching for the dog's collar. No. <laughs> Matt the Mutt does not like being hauled off my father, and now he's barking at my mother, who's put her hands over her ears. My father is shouting something at her, but she can't hear him, what with the barking and the covered ears. Matt the Mutt bounces into the air again, shoves my father against the door. Dad puts his briefcase down. Matt the Mutt raises one leg and pees on it. No, says my mother. My father reaches for his briefcase, but he gets the dog pee on his hand. Now dad is yelling and my mother is shouting and Matt the Mutt is barking some more and leaping into the air and leaping again. Meanwhile, upstairs in the library, our older dog, Penny, looks languidly up from the place where she lies and she thinks, Matt the Mutt, Lord of my love, to whom in vassalage thy merit hath my duty strongly knit, to thee I send this written ambassage to witness duty, not to show my wit. All right, so there's your, <laughs> there's, there's the two, the two flavors of, uh, of, of, of life with dogs, the, uh, the bitter, the bitter and the sweet. Which is going, which leads to my first question, of course. But before I do that, I also just want to make one other um, 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 kind of public service announcement here. Um, some of you um, in this virtual event tonight maybe heard um, Jenny on uh, Terry Gross last night on Fresh Air. If you didn't, you must. Um, it is one of the best interviews. Um, if I didn't know better, if I didn't know Terry, uh, better. I would have thought that she'd given you the questions in advance, but you, <laughs> you, um, you answered them. I, I know that some of the things you said during that interview are things that you've said before, um, but they came out, um, they came out um, fresh, but also um, um, witty and profound. Um, check it out. That's um, nice to say, Rick, because, you know, I, 
Um, it was one of those things, of course, she had me for two hours and they edited it down to what you heard. Yeah. And I did, I did not feel all that good about it after we recorded it. And, um, uh, you know, I, I haven't actually heard it yet, but um, people have told well, me- No, you didn't, I, you didn't get to do Matt the Mutt. I, I didn't get to do Matt the Mutt. <laughs> um, but while we're here, as long as we're making public service announcements, I, I just wanna, especially if you just, if you're just, if you're just tuning in, um, this, uh, this is a, a, a conversation with uh, my friend Rick Russo. Um, it's uh, being sponsored by um, uh, Print, a bookstore in, in Portland. And um, I'd be grateful if you if you want to get a copy of, of, of Good Boy, which has a lovely cover. It looks like this. It's one of the happiest covers I've ever had. Um, if you want to get a copy of Good Boy, I'd be particularly grateful tonight if you'd go and order it from Print uh, in Portland. Uh, I believe that there's going to be, there probably already is, uh, 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 just a link you can click in the, uh, in the chat section of this conversation. Um, and that'll take you right to print where um, obviously this conversation is in support of me and my book, but um, all of us here and uh, the participation of um, MWPA, the Maine Writers and Publishers Alliance, is also trying to keep the torches lit for independent booksellers in Maine who have um, had a particular struggle. Uh, at with with the shutdown. So anyway, that, I just wanted to shout out to to print and to uh, and to MWPA. I'm I'm grateful for all of your support. Thank you. Um, so my my so my first question has to do with those two readings. I didn't know. I I knew you were going to do Matt the Mod. I didn't know what, what else you were going to do, but it does lead to my first question, which is that this among the many things we share, I think Jenny um, is. Um, we take particular delight um, in walking that dangerous knife edge between heartbreak and hilarity. And you do that in, in I mean, really throughout this book. Um, and, and not for the first time in your, in your, in your other memoirs and in your, um, in your, in your fiction too, um, you, seem, you, you seem to take particular pleasure in, in getting the things that break our hearts and the things that make us wet our pants with laughter, you seem to, you, you want to, you, you seem to, you seem to want to get those things as close to each other as possible. And you really do it throughout, uh, throughout Good Boy. Um, um, do you want to talk a little bit about that, about how, yeah. how, how you came to that in this book, how you know, what, it, it just seems like your, your, your default mode as it kind of is. Yeah, and I, I mean, I don't, I, I, I mean, sometimes I, I think it's silly for, for, for writers to try to explain why they see the world one way and not another. Um, but I, I, it, you're right, it has been something I've always been fascinated by. Um, I think it comes on some level from my, from my fundamental belief that, that um, the things that um, make us laugh and the things that make us cry really come from the same well. Um, it's, a sense, it's a sense of the absurd and it's really just a sense of where where things are going to land that, 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 that determines whether it's the source of, of laughter or, or of tears. Um, I think being transgender, at least for me, and I, and I really want to be careful because I don't want to speak for, for the many, many different trans experiences that there are out there, but certainly for me and um, I think for as transgender people of my generation, um, the condition was fundamentally absurd to 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 be born into one physical body and yet to have a sense of yourself a certainty um that you are not you but that you are in fact um that your your soul is well in my case female um that you are wired in, in that way it, it it i mean it's the kind of thing that that there, there's a reason why um drag in some cultures is, in, including ours sometimes, is considered uh, high comedy. I mean, all you have to do is look at Monty Python um, and that era. And we th there's, there's a whole era in which a man in a dress, what could be funnier than that? Well, it is funny to some degree. There's a, there's a way in which um, having an awareness of the, the roles that we play and kind of exaggerating those roles, there is a kind of pleasure and a kind of sense of satire, social satire in that. But if it's you, 
there's also, there's nothing sadder than that. I mean, and it's a thing that I really, really struggled with. And when I, you know, when I first started walking around in the world, looking like I look now, um, it was the most important thing in the world for me. It was a, a, a profound and searing truth. And yet the experience of kind of pulling that veil off, the, th the, the thing that I feared and with good reason on many occasions was that people would think it was funny. So I think to some degree, maybe that's why I see the world in this way. I don't, I mean, I've never really quite thought about it that way before, but um, it's, I guess I've never really understood the idea that, that, um, that laughter is a, is a less mature emotion than, than tears. It seems to me laughter um, properly framed is, is a much more profound response to some of the worst things in the world um, than, than tears. Well, and, and in that respect too, you're a very sneaky writer, I have, I have to <laughs> say, because, because and, 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 and never more so than, than in this book, because um, very, very often in this book, you, you'll, you'll, be, you'll, be, you'll be reading something and picturing a scene in your head that is absolutely hilarious. And only when you, put the, when you finish the scene and you put the book down, you realize that, that for the writer of this book, this is a pretty heavy lift, but you're making it very light for the rest of us. And there's actually something more going on. You get, you get this incredible comic mileage out of Gammy's prosthetic breast for for instance <laughs> well you know, my, tell yeah. me, i don't want i don't want to spoil just to say a little bit there's a, there's a character in this in, in in this book that has a a a, pros, a prosthetic boob yeah yeah gammy gammy so i've gotten a lot of mileage out of my grandmother over the years <laughs> uh, my irish grandmother she uh she was called gammy um and she was just tremendously entertaining uh and the center of every room that we were i remember at our, our wedding reception TV will remember this fondly. Um, at a certain point in the reception, I, I, we, we looked over and she was sitting on top of the piano, smoking a cigarette like this and with a drink in the other hand, and she was surrounded by um, this kind of semicircle of at least a half a dozen enraptured men, um, all of whom were clearly in love with her. And at the time, and, and we got, I got a little closer and it was clear she was telling them all the story of the night of my father's conception. <laughs> well, it gave me pause that moment, but it was not <laughs> typical for her. Um, there's, there's, um, she, um, yeah, at family occasions, she would do stuff like she'd pull out her, her, her prosthesis. Uh, she was also very amused by Matt the Mutt, I should say. She was the one person who just thought it was very funny that this dog was running all over the place and, 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 and that he would hump Gammy's leg. He loved my grandmother's leg. He, he loved, I, I think he, I think, Gammy was married a lot of times and there were some, some of the relationships she had, she was loved less well than she was by Matt, her, or by her yeah. relationship with Matt the Mutt and, and her leg. Um, I believe she did one time shout, he's got more spunk than your grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> But you also, I, I, I guess what I was getting at, Jenny, is that, that, is that this is a book that asks right from the fr first page, right straight through the, to the last page, what is it really that makes a woman, you know? And, and, in, and you very cleverly, I think, that very serious, that very serious subject, um, you, 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 you play with it in, in these, remarkable, these remarkable ways. As you point out at one point in, in the book, almost any possible feminine marker, any marker of femininity, any marker of a woman will not be, will not be present in all women, right? And so a breast, this prosthetic breast, Gammy taking it out and saying, it looks just like a real boob, doesn't it? <laughs> and, it and, it's, and, it's, and it's hilarious, but as I say, when you put the, when you put the book down and think about it for, um, for a minute, you realize that there is some, have, there, there is some, there is some real, stuff going on here and yeah, I guess well, that's kind of what I think um 
it, it's not only about what what makes a woman it's also about what makes us human and i think mm -hmm. um uh, one of the answers that I, I i i pose to that is it's the ability to love one another um except that love is the thing that we are actually i mean we know to talk about dogs means to talk about love but unfortunately we're not uh, all that good at talking about love and just to even suggest that you're going to talk about love means that people are going to roll their eyes or they're going to be uncomfortable. Please don't talk about love. Oh, it's going to be so corny. It's going to be, it's going to come out wrong. Um, and we know that we're here to love each other. I mean, what, what other possible point is there to any of this? And yet it's the thing that we don't know how to do. And I think um, dogs, at least in my experience, give us the, um, the ability to express love without um, self-consciousness without reservation. I mean, you see some of the toughest, um, you know, uh, most repressed people that I know uh, blubber like little babies when it comes to their dogs. Um, and I think I, I, I say at other points in the book that there are um, different things I learned from the different dogs. Like Matt the Mutt, for instance, taught me that it's sometimes it's the people who make um, everyone else's life impossible that are the happiest because matt you know matt the mutt was a was was, was a, a very happy boy <laughs> yes, but not a good boy no it was not a good well <laughs> i don't know they're all good boys in the end right? <laughs> um we had another dog with the hilarious name of playboy uh who was really another dog that was not a particularly good dog um he one time stole the thanksgiving turkey off the dinner table while our backs were turned and kind of ran around with it in his mouth you know growling at us um he uh he would chase after motorcycles uh he would bite he would bite people i remember a friend of mine came over um kenny whom you whom you've met came oh, over sure. one time and uh he, he was like had his feet up on the on their car and he was barking and and my friend said is your dog bite and I, what could i say uh, yeah pretty much <laughs> <laughs> So from Playboy, I learned that sometimes it, it's okay if everybody hates you, as long as one person loves you. And in, that, in this particular case, it was my father who just adored that dog and, um, you know, would just get down on the floor and wrestle with him. Yeah. There's a, there's a um, scene that really sticks in my mind um, for a couple of reasons, Jenny. It's early, it's early in the book. Um, and you, as I recall, correct me if I'm wrong here, but you and you and a little girl are sitting together. Was it in the, a baseball dugout or 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 or? Anyway, yeah. Anyway, what happens there is 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 that is that you said um, to this to this little girl, or wanted to say, I can't remember, but you you either said or wanted to say, "What's it like to be you?" Right. And. Yeah. You had a very specific, you had a very specific question that you wanted to ask, but it kind of stopped me in my tracks because here, here is a very a, a, a young person of of um, a, a, another version of my dear friend now, um, um, who's asking that question, a very specific question. But here we are now, um, years down the road, having written and published how many books between us and thinking to myself what is it like to be you is it was a specific question you wanted to ask her at the time but it's also the question we writers ask every day every time we sit down in front of a, 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 of a computer screen or a blank piece of paper for those of us who write fiction anyway we run up against that with every story, with every novella, with every novel we write, we come, up, we come up against the limitations of what we know because of who we are. Um, there's a question in there, there's a question well, in there you're somewhere. Making me, you're making me think of the, it's the, the idea of the, the, the moral imagination. The idea, yeah. uh, I guess it was the philosopher Edmund Burke who said uh, that it's it's the it's the I mean I think he's the one who coined that name that title the the moral imagination and it means the ability to imagine what the world is like um, outside of your own skin it's the thing that um, you know uh, Scout is Atticus is always telling Scout to to imagine the world 
if you could walk a mile in, in another man's heels. Right. Uh, shoes, shoes, I mean shoes. Shoes, shoes. yes. Sorry. That's right. um, and I think so much of what we struggle with in the world right now is people's inability to be willing to imagine what it's like to be somebody else. So yeah, it's a thing that we struggle with as artists and as writers. And that's, that's, that's kind of the whole point of, of, um, of what we do is we try to inhabit the skin of someone else. But I think in a larger sense, it's, it's the thing that we're really, we ought to be compelled to do as citizens of this country and as of the world, because, um, you know, I mean, I think we see it right now in, in people who are kind of mocking, mocking the idea of, of, um, of catching the coronavirus, because, because since they are, they are not the people who have it, they feel like they don't have to be worried about it. And so what they can be worried about is the economy. And of course, the economy is a terrible, terrible um, problem and a thing that we have to, um, to, to make the effort to recover from this. But um, the inability to, to imagine that you might get this condition, this disease, which might take your life, people's inability to grasp that fact is, is about a failure of imagination. Um, and it's a very, it's a very dramatic one, but it's, 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 I mean, if you think about the prejudice against people of other races and gender identities and sexualities and religions and all of the different forms of bigotry that plague the world, at the heart of that is an unwillingness to imagine what the world is like for people who are not us. Well said. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. And that's and that <laughs> for coming to my TED talk. And in, I was just thinking in, in your um, there's there's a point in this book too where you say that there are all sorts of people who have all sorts of um, theoretical explanations for um, um, for for transgender people over. They have they have they have fancy scientific they have fancy scientific theories that they would like to expound about people like you. And and your prescription for those people is really very simple. And it's kind of what you were just saying, open your heart. Open that's, your heart. Open your heart. Yeah, that's I mean, the only, that's not, the only thing you can do. I mean, I'm not, I don't want to, I'm not, obviously I'm not anti-science and there are things that we need to understand and that, that science and research are the only things that can make us wiser. But if the question is, how do I, what's the best way for me to, to interact with someone whom I do not know, um, who is different from me in some way, you know, I don't, I don't need a computer printout to be a, a friend to somebody. What I need is the ability to be humble before them, to be curious about them, and to, to, open, to, open, your, to open my heart and to, um, and, to get, and to get to know them somehow. Although it's, it's, it's harder to do that than it seems, isn't it? It is, isn't it? It's, it's hard. hard it's hard. hard our business. It's hard in fiction. It's hard in nonfiction, and it's yeah. hard in our lives. Well, I, Jenny, I've got one more question here because I think I think we're getting to the point where Gibson's going to want us to um, open up this to um, um, to some other questions from the audience. I have one other one other question, um, which has to do with magical thinking. Which I think that this 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 book. Um, well, let me give you an example. There's a. There's a point in this book where um, one of these seven dogs, Alex. Um, he was the best, you are, the best of all the good boys, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Alex- He's a very well trained dog anyway. He, he, he was, he's looking out at the water. He says, he's looking out at the ocean. And you have this sense that he is, does he point at that? Does he actually, yeah. he's looking yeah, he out, was, he's, he's focused, he's focused on something and, and he, he um, um, as he looks out, I think you say something like he could he could be he could be looking all the way to the other side of the ocean. He could right. be looking at something on, but he but he's whatever it is, he's very focused on it. And then we forget about that until the very end of the chapter. You do some really nice structural work in all of this. You'll pose a question somewhere, and then just about at the point that the reader has forgotten the question, it comes up again, and it comes up at the end of the section where something, um, and I don't want to, this would be a spoiler, um, but 
but um, at a particularly fraught moment for you, um, you remember Alex looking out across what is it the ocean across yeah it was like time. it was it was a new year's eve in atlantic city and he we yeah all yeah and he's and he sees something that you can't see and he could be looking across time he could be looking across the ocean we don't know what it is but then suddenly you have this this idea that what you're experiencing right now in this other place is what alex was looking at which i think is a pretty good definition of magical thinking yeah right? but 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 i guess my question is um what do we what do we think of because we do that all the time well how would i sometimes people think of magical thinking as a kind of surrender of our rationality whereas in this book i think and um and, and in probably a lot of our lives magical thinking is is just nothing more than the thing that we were sent here to do which was, which is, think about the possible meanings of this existence of ours, this shared existence of ours. So, do you have any thoughts about magical this, this um, magical well, thinking um, that because there's a lot of it in this book? It seems to me there was. Correct me if I'm wrong. Well, I'll give you a very a very down to earth answer. To that is just, I mean, in, to some degree, magical thinking is. I mean, I, mean, I hate to say this, but it's 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 at the heart of our relationship with with dogs and with other animals too. Um, you know, uh, you, you see people who will tell you, you know, that they're, you know, they, they have a dog and somebody comes down the room um, and the dog, the dog growls and then the owner will, will, you know, will later lean toward it and say, oh, Binky doesn't like men, you know, or, um, you know, uh, uh, Binky knew, knew that that person was depressed. Binky doesn't like depressed people. Or, you know, we, or we, we, I have to be careful here because I think, I mean, people's relationships with dogs really are genuine. Um, and there, there is a kind of, kind of, there's a very real love and a back and forth and exchange, but I think between humans and dogs, but people also project stuff onto dogs, you know, uh, and, um, you know, people buy their dogs little hats. Uh, and make the dogs wear their little hats and they say, oh, Binky loves his little hat. Well, Binky, we all know Binky does not love the little hat. What, <laughs> Binky, what Binky probably loves is the milk bone you're going to give him after wearing the hat, you know. Um, so there is a way in which to have a, I mean, so you have a relationship with a dog, which is a, which is a creature that cannot talk and... Um, Although they do in your book. Well, well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> We um, we put well. It's what I do. I put my words in the dogs in the dogs. Sure. Right, um, sure. And but I believed it every time. <laughs> it is. It's the way we make sense of the world. Maybe it's just a matter of having imagination. Um, and for for all the trouble people getting get into, um, you know, it's I, I'd still rather get in trouble because my imagination was too large than too small. Thank you, too. That was very well said. <laughs> there. Oh, hi, Gibson. <laughs> <laughs> what is that guy's name? We need a name for him. Uh, this, is, this was actually a, a, a puppet of my, uh, of my kids um, whose name is Puppet Eating Dog. We used to, we used to have a puppet theater. Actually, we still have the puppet theater. It's in the basement now. We had a, a half a dozen puppets, and every puppet show we put on ended with this puppet coming out and eating the other puppets. <laughs> and so it's it's really a one joke thing, but this is, his name is Puppet Eating Dog. I'm Puppet Eating Dog. Uh, well, Jenny and Rick, we have some, we do have some great questions. So I wanna invite some people in to, to I can ask a few of them myself or what, if, if people wanna ask them themselves, they can too. Um, if Maria Padian is still on the line, I'd love to have Maria ask her question. Maria, are you still there? Hello, Maria. Unmute. Yeah, oh, there I am. Hi. Um, hello. Um, the question I had was, um, the poet Mary Oliver has also used really moving and humorous dog stories as a conduit for exploring pain and sadness and love. And I wondered how you would compare her work to what you've done in this memoir. 
she, I know Mary Oliver's work, but I don't know the, um, the dog poems per se. Um, uh, I, I think of her as a poet with um, a large heart and a great understanding of um, human nature, but I, I really can't, unfortunately, I can't answer the, I mean, does, Rick, are you familiar with, with those poems? No, I'm not. I'm, 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 I'm at a loss as well. Well, Mary, what, what do you, yeah, she does, what do you she think? Does have, she does have one volume that's called Dog Poems, but she talks about particular dogs, like Percy in particular, um, throughout a lot, of her, a lot of her work. Anyway, if, if you're not familiar with them, what I would say is you may very much enjoy them. Um, they, are, they are wonderful. And because I love them so much, I'm guessing that I'll probably love your memoir as well. Oh, I hope so. Um, if I think of writers, I mean, there are a lot of writers who've written really well about dogs. And I think my favorite is probably James Thurber, who is a writer that um, a lot of people don't read anymore because some of his work has not aged well. Uh, but the stories about dogs are very, very true. And in fact, there was a, um, there was a television show when I was a child called My World and Welcome to It, which was a slightly um, fictionalized uh, situation comedy about the life and work of James Thurber. And, um, in, and, and Thurber's uh, great love was for bloodhounds. He just loved bloodhounds. Uh, I think he had three or four of them uh, at any one time. And um, the, uh, in, in this, there was one episode where one of the bloodhounds dies. And here's this pretty, and, and the, the character is played by, the, the character was uh, William, the actor, the actor was William Wyndham. I don't know if you remember that, that actor, but William Wyndham, who was Thurber, is essentially weeping because his dog has died. And it was, it was I remember being shocked that a, that a comedy on television ended this way. And I heard the sound and I turned around and there's my father with Playboy in his lap with the tears running down his face. And it was the first time I ever remember seeing my father cry. Um, and if you're a child, and a boy in particular, the first time you remember seeing your father cry genuinely is a thing you'll never forget. And for me, it was my father crying about dogs. And he said, I just kind of looked at him, I'm like, I didn't say this, but my, my face must have said, what? And my father simply said, well, it's sad. <laughs> great story. Um, we have a question. Uh, it looks like Brooke Minner has a question about a family dog. Brooke, do you want to ask your question? Uh, yeah, sure. Can you hear me okay? Hi, Brooke. Hi. Um, so this is really timely because uh, we lost our dog last year. And just today, I believe, we connected with a rescue dog in southern Maine that we're going to uh, to pick up later this week. And my question was really about, um, I have an 11 year old daughter. She's an only child. Uh, she's lonely, <laughs> we're in quarantine. And I think that she kind of thinks of the dog as sort of a pseudo sibling. <laughs> and I was just kind of wondering, you know, if you can remember how you felt as an 11 year old or around that time, um, if that makes sense to you and just kind of to oh, get yeah. your thoughts. Yeah, thank you, Brooke. Um, in fact, um, in the, I guess it's the second chapter, um, I get a dog on my 11th birthday, and uh, she's a Dalmatian. Um, we'd already had the Dalmatian Playboy. Why we went back to get another Dalmatian from the same breeder, I cannot tell you, because clearly the, the Dalmatians had been overbred. Whenever they made another 101 Dalmatians movie, there was just you know, there was a run on, on the breed that didn't end well. Anyway, we, 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 we brought this dog home and for the first couple of years since we got her, I just, she was like my best friend and I carried her everywhere. And uh, she was, um, you know, I carried her like a rag doll. She slept in my bed. I just adored that dog. But the dog was kind of a sad dog. She, uh, she had some sort of, I, I won't give you the whole, the whole list, but she like lost the hair on her tail and she like had this weird gunk that came out of her eyes. She became a fat, she became this kind of disgusting kind of creature. It was really a sad dog. And by the time I was 15, so it was four years later, 
I was too cool for Penny, whom by now we were calling Sausage. And I learned another thing about love, a, a bad thing about love, actually, which is that love can change and that um, it can be hard to make, to keep a promise at one age that you made when you were, when you were younger. Um, I hope that doesn't happen to your daughter, though. And I hope that your dog doesn't lose the hair in its tail. <laughs> it's a little easier if you're... Thank you so much. That's great. Thank you. Uh, uh, sorry, my, Dee has an essay. That's right. Well, we're, we're remembering that Ranger, uh, who's the last dog in the book, also came into our children's lives when they were just about that same age. Um, but, you know, and they never lost their affection for Ranger, fortunately, but they did they did commit the sin of going off to college. Um, and, you know, we, so, so there we are. It's not just bad enough that our, our children are, have, have grown, grown and, and, and flown, but there's Ranger sitting by the front door. I remember um, when our son, Sean, went to grad school. So he graduated, he came back from college, he graduated from college, he was home for the summer. And at the end of the summer, Sean loaded up his car and drove off. And I remember Ranger, who is now a very old dog, standing in the middle of our dirt road, just watching the car dis disappear up and over the hill. Um, I'll never forget that. It was sad. <laughs> but, but it's the kind of sadness that's the gift that, that you get. Um, I mean, that's, that's the thing about dogs. We, we love them, um, and then they leave us. Um, and uh, Anne Miriam Budner. Anne Miriam, did you want to ask your question? Sure. It's on Miriam. Sorry. And no, don't. You did a great job, actually. Uh, and uh, Jenny, I actually live on the main line most of the year and hey. part of the year. What town do you live in? Bryn Mawr. Bryn Mawr. Yep. So I live kitty corner across from Church of the Redeemer. Oh. Ah. Uh, but what I would, what I was really interested in is because so much of your childhood was here and reading this book, which I did read already, um, is very specific. You know, it's, it feels very much like you are here. I mean, and you give a sense of the environment, but at the same time, it, it's, you know, it's, it's approachable to anybody who isn't here. I mean, as somebody who lives here, I was like excited because it's my area, but, um, and I wanted to get a sense of, you know, do you think consciously about physical location in the same way that you no, think no, no, about no. characters? Well, you know, it's actually a thing that I learned from my friend Richard Russo who once told me, we were once talking about um, place in fiction, which is not all that different from place in nonfiction. And Rick said something, and Rick, tell me if I'm misquoting you, it's something like um, place is the container of the story. It's like the picture that holds, um, the, if, if, if the story and the characters are uh, the, 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 the liquid, uh, the the picture that holds that holds it all is um, the um, se is the sense of place, and I think place at one time was something that I really just kind of took for granted, um, and it's really I mean if you read if you read any of, of Rick's novels you get a very very strong sense of place, and even if you know upstate New York is not I mean. Rick is famous for writing about rust, rust Belt um, towns and Rust Belt communities. But if you read the, the books that are set in Gloversville, New York, and the books that are set on the main coast, it's, you know that you're in two very, very different places. Um, even if some of the characters seem to have, have, have come from some of, sort of a similar place, maybe. Um, anyway, that's the thing that, that I learned from Rick. Uh, and I, yeah, I do think about place. I mean, I write about the main line because that's where I grew up. And I think you have a particular relationship with the place um, that, you, that you knew first. It was a place that I was dying to get away from um, because I felt it was a very um, artificial place. Um, and of course, and I did get away from it. I, I moved away, I went to college and, um, and never really lived there full time again 
but having escaped it now, it's all I think about. And my, you know, my mother died 10 years ago. We sold her house. At least once a week, I dream that I'm back in her house having a conversation with her. <laughs> so you, you, you think you can get away, but you, you can't really get away. Thank you. Jenny, we have a, a number of, uh, not maybe not surprisingly, a number of Colby folks on the, on the- Hi, <laughs> Colby not, College. Who chimed in and expressed uh, their, uh, missing you <laughs> on campus. But um, there was, uh, and I actually don't know if this is a Colby person or not, but uh, Alia was wondering, what is your favorite class that you've taught during your time as a professor? Well, I mean, first of all, I want to say I miss I miss Colby very much as as well. I I love my new job at Barnard. It's actually it's not that new anymore. I think this is my sixth year there. But you know, I spent twenty five years at Colby, um, several of those of those years sharing an office with Rick, and I there were things that made me really mad. The way you get mad at any place that you work for work at for twenty five years, but but I I made. I made friends and relationships of a lifetime. I learned about teaching there and the relationships that I had with students. Um, I hear from, I got heard from a, a, a member of the class of 92 today, in fact, someone who heard me on Fresh Air yesterday. Um, so Colby's a very special place and there's some wonderful things happening at Colby now and I'm sorry I'm not part of Colby to be part of them now, to tell you the truth. Um, the class, I, there's a class that I teach, I'm actually teaching right now at Barnard, but I also first offered it at Colby. And it's a class in revision, which I think is the most important thing for a writer, but it's also the thing that we don't really teach the, the, the practice of revision particularly well. And, and by that, I mean, what usually happens in a, in a fiction or a nonfiction workshop is we come in, we talk about the story, usually talking about the story means talking about the plot and the characters, those two big things, as well as some other other issues if there's time toward the end of the workshop but at the end of that you, we we send we send the um the writer off and we say okay we'll do another draft so long and then if any you know with any luck we see we see that work at the end of the semester and we say oh so this is how this turned out and it's it just it strikes me as um i also noticed that so many of my students will do they, they i mean even people who want to be writers they hand that story in, they write that story the day it's due. Sometimes it's late because they didn't write it. So they, they and, and now I know it's being written, you know, if it was due on a Wednesday and it comes in on a Friday, I mean, I know it got written on a Thursday. Um, so it seems to me that the, it's the practice of writing. It's the practice of revision that's the most important thing to write. So very, very briefly, what happens in the class is, first assignment is the students write a seven page st story not six, not eight. Second, we, we do the workshop, we send them off. Second assignment, they come back with the same story now as a 21 page story. So we go from seven to 21, we come in, we do the workshop, we talk about it, and then I send them away. Another three weeks goes by and now they write the set story as a three page story. And they have to, in this this story they have to read out loud before everyone and kind of listen. And I try to help them with public speaking a little bit. But after that, the last assignment is the fourth draft with the length unspecified. So it could literally be a page, or it could be a hundred pages if they want it. And to me, that that just kind of forces students into what I feel is the the the, the practice of most of the writers I know is just the first draft is not about getting it perfect. The first draft is about getting it on the page. And then the second draft, the second draft is kind of the question of, well, here's everything I can think of that might happen in this piece. And in the third piece, it's make it shine or find the one little moment that's going to Im um, imply the rest of the story. Um, and so having written it medium, long and short, now you know what the story wants to be. And you can now you can write your fourth draft, which is actually your first draft. Anyway, that's my favorite course at Colby and at Barnard too. That's great. Um, Carl, Carl Little had a question. Carl, did you want to jump in here? We're just not down to our last question or two. Um, Carl, did you want to ask your question? Yeah. Um, hi there. Um, I, oh. It's not really a question. I was just, I noticed recently that there's a lot of uh, word that um, 
there, there are many more dog adoptions happening now during the pandemic. And I, and I, I, I guess I can answer my own question. I mean, it's, it seems to me it's a, it's a way for people to, to deal with isolation. It's sort of like Brooke, Brooke Minner bringing in the dog into her family. Um, you know, we, we, we need, we need that kind of connection, but dogs are really special in that regard. It seems to me. And, and I, I'm just, I think it's just wonderful that so many dogs are getting adopted. Was my yeah, it's, I think it's also a way of doing something good in the world. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a kind of selfish way of doing good because you end up with a dog and that's nice, but you know, the, right. there are, there are always going to be more dogs in shelters than there are available um, owners. I kind of hate that word owner because you don't really own a dog. If you're really, your dog owns you more, <laughs> more, more likely. For but, sure. Um, I think, I think adopting a dog, it's, it's not just that you get the gift of the dog. You also have the gift. I mean, you, you're also, I mean, it's, we're selfish about it because we get to, we get to have a dog, but we're also in many cases saving, saving a dog's life. Um, yeah. so it's, it's a way of doing good at a time when I think a lot of us are feeling, um, trapped at home and unable to affect the world in any positive way. So yeah, I think it's great. Sure. Thanks. And did, did, uh, was this a book that you've been writing sort of like your whole life? Cause you're clearly a dog person and have been for a long, um, long time. Or was it one that you sort of realized like, Oh, like there's a whole thing here that I haven't explored before. I wish I had a good, um, uh, Genesis story for this book to tell you the truth. I, when, 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 um, when Indigo died, that piece that I read, um, that hit me really hard. And it was funny because we saw it coming for, for, you know, that she had cancer. She had cancer for a long time. It was, I mean, we, we knew we were going to lose this dog and we'd lost dogs before, but I don't know. We just, we just loved that dog. Um, in fact, if I have a, if I have, if I, if I have a, um, I have a, 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 a picture somewhere, I think I can even share with your, with your, um, with everybody, a picture of, of, of Indigo which is going to involve a little bit of, of me clicking here. Can I find a picture of Indigo? Yeah, here it is. Okay, so stand by, everybody. Okay, so hang on for a second. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share my screen. This is, uh, this is what Indigo looked like. Oh, okay, okay. a host is this disabled screen sharing. Okay, so I can't do this. Um, Anyway, she was she was just such a character, and um, so I wrote a piece about her. I wrote a piece for my Times column, and my time. Um, oh, it says I'm the co-host now. Can I can yeah, do it. Just did that. <laughs> can I try it now? All right, yeah. here we go. Here comes Indigo. Oh. <laughs> that's what, now. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay. Um, so I wrote a piece for my Times column, which in, in case you don't read the Times, it, it, it comes out every other Wednesday. And, um, it, you know, I had a column due. Um, actually, it wasn't really, it wasn't losing Indigo that, um, that gave me the column. It was adopting Chloe. It was adopting the, the, the dog after Indigo. Because I'd really said that thing, I'm never going to have another dog. I cannot do this to myself again. It's too painful. Um, and then I heard about this dog, Chloe, who needed a home. And I asked Dee Dee about it. And she agreed with me. She said, no, we can't. No, we're, you're, you've got to be crazy. We're not doing that again. And uh, so then I was driving by the place where I knew the dog was. Um, a few weeks later, and I thought, well, why don't I just go see what the dog looks like? <laughs> yeah, how did I think the story was going to end? <laughs> so at the end of that, and this is how that first chapter ends, um, she looks, at, she, I look at her and I say, well, if you wanted, I would stay with you too. So I wrote that column, and the column was a, a big hit. It was like the number one column at the time was for, for, uh, for the better part of that week. And so I kind of thought, hmm, maybe there's something there. I, I mean, I, I was reluctant to write a dog book. Um, uh, I have a friend who's a cartoonist, who's, and he, he's a, you know, he tells me that among cartoonists, there's a phrase for when a cartoonist d goes commercial. 
It's called Going Cat Book. Um, he, like, yeah, so and so, I really respected his work, but then he went all cat book. And I was afraid as a writer, I didn't want to go dog book. I mean, when I first started writing a column for the Morning Sentinel 20 years ago, um, the editor, David Offer, told me there's only one thing you can't write don't write the dog, the dead dog column. <laughs> Which is, I guess, a genre all in of itself. And yet, um, I guess what I wanted to do was to, to talk about dogs, but in talking about dogs, to be able to talk about um, my own life as well, to talk, and I guess the big thing for me was that the dogs that I had, I had before transition. So in a way, talking about the dogs enabled me to remember boyhood and manhood, which is a thing that I don't get to write about so much anymore, and to kind of build a bridge between who I am now and who I used to be. And that's what the dogs let me do. That's, that's one. That's, that's a long that's, answer, isn't it? That's a great answer. And it's a, it's a, it's a great place to leave it, I think. Um, and uh, I just want to say huge thanks to you, Jenny, and to you, Rick, for, for doing this. And thanks to everybody out there for your questions and for, uh, for all you're doing. And um, yeah. Yeah, you're all great. Uh, just a couple more final words from our sponsor. Um, yeah, please. Remember, please support um, Maine Writers and Publishers Alliance, MWPA. They make events like this possible. Don't forget your independent bookseller, especially print, a bookstore, which is a good place where you can actually buy um, Good Boy, uh, now on sale. Um, and, uh, and, 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 did you forget someone? Yes, I, okay. And thanks to my friend Rick Russo, who's been um, a friend, friend of a lifetime. Uh, I, I, when I think about my long relationship with Russo, I think about the end of, you know, the end of Charlotte's Web, um, when Wilbur the Pig says, it is not often that you have a great, a great friend who's also a good writer. <laughs> some pig. I, I thought you were going to say some pig. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's still time. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Good night.